Hi everyone, <clears throat> excuse me. So welcome to this week's topic of um, mycological fictions. So this is the first of um, three lectures or at least three topics that I'm going to be delivering for you on reading the contemporary. And the other two will be uh, Oceanic Aesthetics in week seven and the Black Anthropocene in week 10. What I've done is I've kind of designed these three lectures to be interconnected and all of them relate to my current research project. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment on eco-catastrophe narratives uh, and I'm thinking through various ideas to do with environmental post-humanism. So I'm hoping that these lectures will relate to one another and they might also suggest um, lines of inquiry and maybe unexpected connections perhaps across other lectures on uh, this module from my colleagues. Um, so as we've been asked to divide our lectures uh, in half into kind of 30 minute bite sized chunks, this particular topic has been divided into two. So I've got the lecture that you're watching right now, which is part one, and that is called The Promise of Mushrooms. Um, and I've got part two, which will be on mycological fictions. So just briefly, so you know that you're in the right place if you're watching this. Um, this lecture is going to be talking about the uh, cultural and philosophical implications of fungi, of, of mushrooms and fungal lives. Um, and I'm going to be looking at recent research into the microbial sciences and I'm going to think about what implications they have for us literature and culture scholars in the humanities um, and ideas of kind of the human and the non-human. And then when we finish with this lecture, you can hop over to part two. And there I'm going to be looking more closely at the trope of fungi and science fiction. And I'll be focusing on our set text for this week, which is um, Tarde Thompson's brilliant alien invasion narrative, um, Rosewater. OK, so what I'm going to be concerned about with today then is how do mushrooms and their mycelial networks suggest new political, aesthetic and social encounters and what can they teach us? So I'm just going to do uh, a quick screen share uh, and uh, I will get my lectures up for you, uh, my slides, sorry, for you. Play from start. OK, great. There we go. So you may have noticed mushrooms popping up in recent years, whether in the latest gourmet trend in international trade shows and foodie magazines, which are claiming now that mushrooms are um, a superfood, or perhaps amongst the health and wellness industries. Medicinal mushrooms have been increasing in popularity over the past few years, promising everything from boosting your immune system to contributing towards brain health stimulating neurons, improving short-term memory, uh, and using their powerful antioxidants to fight free radicals in your body. But they've also been preoccupying academics, particularly since the American anthropologist Anna Lohenhout Singh published her influential study, The Mushroom at the End of the World, on the possibility of life in the capitalist ruins. And artists seem to be uh, obsessed with mushrooms at the moment and with fungi as well. So Somerset House had an exhibition earlier this year uh, in February 2020 called Mushrooms, the Art, Design and Future of Fungi, um, which I put the screen grab up for you here. Uh, I think I've also inserted this into the tile for Moodle so that you can have a look around the virtual exhibition because of course this, um, this happened around the same time as lockdown. Uh, and so luckily for us, they made a kind of virtual tour so you can see what was on, even though perhaps you didn't manage to make it to Somerset House. Um, and so this followed on from the success of a similar exhibition in Paris curated by Francesca Gavin. Um, and as Gavin says then uh, in her introduction, mushrooms are playful. She says they remind us of childhood. They're also delightfully phallic, which is always a pleasure. And along with rising veganism and extinction rebellion, mushroom foraging joins a growing list of subcultures and activisms. Uh, as two artists featured in this exhibition who call themselves the mycological twist um, suggest, and I quote, because they are so entangled in ecosystems, mushrooms have a potential to be subversives. They remain mysterious, resisting labeling and understanding, 
they are something you collaborate with rather than simply use. So I want to think in this lecture then about the idea of mushrooms as um, mysterious, as subversive, as something that we might collaborate with. Why are so many artists, cultural theorists and writers turning to fungal lives in this contemporary moment? What can mushrooms and the study of fungi more broadly, um, which is known as mycology, teach us about our own selves, about our human predicament at this time of capitalist and ecological crisis? So perhaps we agree then that mushrooms are on trend and this idea of collaborating with them, attempting to discern their mysterious place within entangled ecosystems will reveal mushrooms to be a particularly apt example of what's been taking place in um, philosophical and cultural inquiry over the past few years. And so these are things um, which are variously referred to as the critical or the environmental post-humanities. Um, these are influenced by feminist materialisms or sometimes referred to as the new materialisms. Uh, we might also have heard perhaps of the environmental humanities and maybe even of the affective turn as it's been applied to eco-criticism. That's quite a lot of academic um, terms, so don't worry, I'm going to come back and unpick some of those um, as we go through this lecture. But for now, just think about this notion of entanglement. It's important to our consideration of mycological possibility and what I'm calling mycological fictions. Entanglement is a widely used conceptual term. It's been made popular by thinkers such as Anna Lohenhaupt Singh, um, whom I mentioned a moment ago, and also Donna Haraway. It runs through a wide range of post-humanist thinking and at its core, really, it's an idea borrowed from ecology to describe how multiple entities are reciprocally involved in each other's ongoing life and survival. So rather than perhaps um, an older model of competition for survival, this idea of entanglement acknowledges that we are not discreetly bounded kind of individual subjects, that we're not even actually, when you think about it, as human as we might like to think. When you start looking into the number of microorganisms, the bacteria that live inside us and that make our basic human functioning possible, with things like our digestive systems and our immune systems, you start to realise that the kind of old humanist model of discrete bounded individual subjectivity doesn't really work anymore. So at the microbial level, it turns out um, uh, microbes are essential to the functioning of our bodies. Um, and our bodies, of course, have evolved over thousands of years of evolutionary history in tandem with microscopic, um, these microscopic colonists inside us. In a fascinating new study called Entangled Life, which just came out in the last month or two, the fungal biologist Merlin Sheldrake introduces the, what he describes as the grossly understudied world of fungal life um, and how it supports all plant life and yet remains deeply mysterious to human interest or observation. Mushrooms, as he reminds us, are the fruiting bodies of complex subterranean networks. So fungi and their, their fruits, their mushrooms, spend most of their lives as um, branching fusing networks of tubular cells known as mycelium. As he explains then, whereas animals put food into their body to ingest and process nutrients, fungi actually place their bodies into their food sources. And so that process requires a kind of endless remodeling and reshaping of themselves, weaving themselves into their surroundings, stringing themselves through soil, inside plants, even under the oceanic bed. These fungal mycelial networks are then in turn used by other organic life. So bacteria use them um, as highways to uh, transport um, and navigate a bustling wilderness that is the subterranean soil. Fungi then at their most basic level are a kind of living embodiment of this idea of entanglement. Um, as Sheldrake says, fungi form literal connections between organisms and in so doing remind us that all life forms, humans included, are bound up within seething networks of relationships, some visible and some less so. <laughs> 
Um, I think what I find particularly interesting in, uh, in Sheldrake's book, which is a sort of um, a weird mixing of genres, bits of it are kind of life writing, some of it's quite kind of creative and poetic, a lot of it references popularizations of scientific research um, that he's come across in his professional career. But one thing that really stood out for me, there are various sort of philosophical moments in this book by Merlin Sheldrake. And he says that mycelium is better thought of not as um, a thing, even a thing as complicated as a network, which is sort of distributed, decentered, multitudinous. But he says we should think of mycelium as a process. Um, he says it's ecological connective tissue. It's the living scene by which much of the world is stitched into relation. And this idea of process, I think, really resonates with a lot of um, more contemporary environmental post-humanist thinking. So you may have heard perhaps of the wood wide web, um, something that was coined uh, leading out of microbial research in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and really this was a kind of new way of thinking about plant and um, biological life. Prior to this, plants had been understood to be separate ecological units which competed for resources. And work by Suzanne Simard revealed the way in which actually plants are able to share carbon in these kind of um, mycorrhizal networks. It introduced us to the idea that they can share resources, they could possibly even be donating a surplus carbon to other plants in the system who are more in need at that time. And this research being published in the 1990s really coincided with a vital period in kind of modern network science in which people were thinking about networks. They were thinking about decentralized networks such as the internet. And this idea of sort of networking and rhizomatic entanglement really became popular in the 1990s. <clears throat> uh, and it actually, the idea of the wood wide web led to be uh, inspiring James Cameron in his 2009 film Avatar with the, um, if you've seen it, you'll know there's a kind of tree at the center of this indigenous forest world of Pandora, sort of willow-like, um, bioluminescent, um, a living network, uh, <clears throat> which um, brings to the silver screen that idea of sort of sharing resources in an entangled um, mycorrhizal style network. As Tim Jones wrote in a Guardian article published in February of this year, fungi have grown in popularity recently, and this builds on an earlier 20th century um, set of representations of mushrooms and their subterranean mycelial networks. So um, as you can see here then, Cy Twombly painted them in um, the mid 1970s. Um, Andy Warhol, that's the image on the right. I may have to fix that caption so you can see what it says. He filmed the painter Robert Indiana eating a mushroom in his 1963 film Eat. And perhaps most interestingly, uh, the avant-garde um, composer John Cage wrote, co-wrote a book about mushrooms, The Mushroom Book, in 1972. But this drew on a, a lifelong interest with mushrooms. Um, he used to teach a mushroom identification course at the New School in New York in the late 1950s. Um, and that led to the revival of the New York Mycological Society. Um, as he famously said, I've come to the conclusion that much can be learned about music by devoting oneself to the mushroom. And if we go back a little bit further, we might also note that Victorian fairy paintings are also full of mushrooms. Um, and I picked out one example for you here. This is Richard uh, Doyle's Triumphal March of the Elf King by Night from 1870. So fairy paintings from the Victorian period situated their ethereal worlds within arboreal settings that were scaled down to the forest floor with its leaf litter, its giant bird and insect life, its wispy fern fronds and its colourful architectural mushrooms. As Mosalio Schechter notes, during the 1850s and into the 1870s, this, this fascination um, became a, a mushroom craze and it joyfully proclaimed its fantastical departure from um, the much more <clears throat> disciplined sort of realist art which had preceded it. And as Schechter says, this displays a fascination with romantic subjects in natural settings, the popularity of the occult and the supernatural, and not, yet, not least, the casual use of laudanum. And perhaps you may know this or you may not know this, um, the hugely popular children's author Beatrix Potter was a well-known mycologist 
and she produced hundreds of detailed botanical illustrations of fungi collecting specimens and adding to taxonomies that were used by other mycologists worldwide. Her work was even presented at the Linnaean Society. Um, uh, at the time, women weren't allowed to appear in person, so a male colleague had to read out her paper. Um, and her illustrations of fungi were praised for their scientific accuracy. So mushrooms then have been um, uh, influential in various different art forms, visual art um, uh, and so on. And I want to come back to the recent exhibition at Somerset House, Mushrooms, the Art, Design and Future of Fungi, which I mentioned um, a little bit earlier. And I want to think also about the timing of this exhibition earlier on this year in 2020, and how this relates to a recent explosion of interest in fungi and the fruiting bodies of mushrooms that they produce. As the exhibition catalogue stated, um, and I quote, at this moment of deep ecological crisis, the mushroom has become a figure of resilience and new life, embodying a new complex hybrid way of being. Mm. So it's worth reflecting on this in a little more detail. I've got here for you a slightly longer extension of that quotation from the catalogue. So it, it states, for centuries in Europe, mushrooms were objects of horror and disgust, connected to witchcraft, poison and decay. It was only in the 19th century with the rise of amateur botany and the appearance of mushrooms in children's literature, such as Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, that their reputation started to change. Today, the mushroom has both become the inspiration for new models of society and economics and been positioned by theorists as a parable for environmental renewal. The London-based artist, um, Shauna Gavin, <clears throat> I just had a picture, there we go, a moment ago, I, lo I love this one, Galactic Mushroom Highway, <clears throat> excuse me, a very sci-fi rendering of what mushrooms might look like in extraterrestrial worlds. So she finds inspiration in mushrooms to create collages of otherworldly landscapes using vintage photographic material. Uh, and what I find particularly fascinating about the use of collage, which was popular amongst um, uh, avant-garde kind of modernist uh, writers um, and thinkers in the early 20th century, is that the way in which it brings into coexistence multiple different timescales competing, often completely incompatible. Um, and uh, as, as we will have by now already discussed in the first session on the contemporary, this idea of contemporaneity itself is a, is a conceptual container for various different kinds of temporality, which um, are non-synchronous, if you like. And Shauna Gavin's work, uh, <clears throat> published um, last year and more recently uh, this year, then draws on popular associations of mushrooms in science fiction, but also those fairy tale narratives I mentioned a moment ago, Lewis Carroll, Beatrix Potter's um, kind of Edwardian and Victorian stories for children that, that relate back to the Victorian obsession with fairy kingdoms in the woods. Meanwhile, the artist and filmmaker David Fenster dresses as a mushroom <laughs> whenever the opportunity presents itself. He says, I wear my mushroom costume as often as possible. Like mushrooms themselves, it seems to attract or repel, depending on the individual. It definitely gets people's attention. And I think mushrooms deserve our attention. They're overlooked, especially in fungiphobic cultures like ours, which is probably why artists are so interested in them. Fungiphobic is quite hard to say, but I also italicised it to draw attention to it. <clears throat> and... Um, the costume that he uses, which is basically a kind of mushroom cap headpiece uh, with a sort of white, um, uh, I don't know, face covering, um, is also featured in uh, a film that he's made, a short film, uh, which I haven't seen yet, but I desperately want to, which is narrated from a mushroom's point of view, in which the mushroom complains that humans anthropomorphize nature. What can we learn from them, Fenster asks? basically everything, how to be better humans, how to talk to non-human nature, and how to love ourselves and the rest of the organisms on the planet. So this idea of the non-human point of view um, really fascinates me. Oops, here we go. And I consider it to be one of the preeminent aesthetic and literary problems of our contemporary moment. As the academics Natalia Cecir and um, Sam Solomon write, uh, and I quote, although I'm sorry, that's not the actual quote you can see here, but <clears throat> I know you're smart enough to focus on two things at the same time. 
So they say historically understudied relative to plants and animals and often studied in the context of agricultural pests and minor ailments, fungi challenge many biological paradigms that were developed from plant and animal models. They thus offer rich ground for utopian imaginaries, often seeming to offer either an alternative to capitalism or as a new untapped resource to rescue capitalism in a kind of eco-friendly fungal fix promising to balance ecology and economics. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about this idea that fungi somehow offer utopian possibilities for, to help us to think about better and different futures outside of capitalist exploitation, accumulation and environmental destruction. And actually, um, a good place to start in tracing this is the bizarre subculture of the radical mycology movement. That's what you can see here, this idea of radical ecology. Um, when I started researching this lecture and I read more about um, this particular subculture, I started to wonder what on earth I was doing because psychedelic drugs are a big part of it. <laughs> but broadly speaking, within an academic framework then, um, it's really interesting as a subculture, and you can see here from this anti-copyright zine uh, in 2009 that was published by the Spore Liberation Front, uh, and then it was subsequently turned into a book. Um, they intended it then to be, the reason they didn't want it to have any association with copyright at all, was that this would be a spore to be spread across the globe. Uh, and the zine then offers tips on growing and foraging for mushrooms, on recipes, summaries of the impact of mushrooms, and particularly the um, psilocybin containing mushrooms, also known as psychedelic or magic mushrooms, um, and thoughts about human history and the culture of the relationship between humans and mushrooms. The complex life cycle of mushrooms, the authors note, provide profound and novel examples of networking between different species and environs not exhibited by most other life forms. So I pulled out one uh, little passage for you here, which I'll just read out to give you a sense of their project. <clears throat> As the Spore Liberation Front write, our mycelium is our affinity groups and open collectives working synergistically toward the common goal of absolute freedom. Our spores are our dreams and aspirations. We liberate spores, the spores that eject from our consciousness by the millions daily. Those that tell us to quit our jobs, learn a trade, seed a garden, to fall in love and to care. The spores that alone may, um, may not germinate beyond a few steps, but when combined with those like them and surrounded by soil awaiting a new force of life, have the potential to transform whole ecosystems. These spores are ever present in the soil, microscopic, hidden and unseen, yet everywhere. They may lie in wait for years until the right conditions tell them to arise. It's an interesting document <clears throat> and it's worth uh, a quick read. Um, I think what I find particularly compelling about it is um, the way in which they see mushrooms as their sacred allies. And so the mycelial networks of the mushrooms then suggest these decentralized um, kind of activist structures to share resources and share tactics. The strong, effective and emotional responses that they provoke offer nourishment to people dedicating their lives to environmental activism, particularly in the face of kind of continual defeat from uh, the powers that be in, in taking this activism seriously. And also the hallucinogenic properties of particular mushrooms also connect people with a longer tradition of anti-establishment counterculture um, and particularly the kind of psychedelic counterculture in the 1960s and 70s. And it's worth saying as batshit as that may sound, um, more recently there, have, there has been a return to studies um, of uh, the effects of psychedelic mushrooms on human consciousness. So it's something that neuroscientists are returning to in quite a serious um, scientific endeavour. So the grassroots radical um, mycology movement then, part of a larger countercultural DIY movement that we can date back to the 1960s and 1970s, suggests I think the political power of the fungal imaginary, if we can call it that, um, as this sort of decentralised metaphor for gathering information, for spreading spores, applying DIY tactics to using mushrooms uh, within environmental activism. 
and it's full of people who are going out and doing experiments with mushrooms and 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 it's full of a lot of citizen scientists so there's a really interesting role of the amateur kind of mushroom forager grower mycologist if you like and they they do have connections with um actual research labs as well but this kind of explicitly anti-capitalist discourse concerning mushrooms can also be found in contemporary art. And I would point you to this fantastic um, example, a couple of examples here from um, Jane Lawson. So she's a Manchester based explicitly anti-capitalist artist. She's produced a series of installations which explore the idea of um, myco remediation. So what is myco remediation? Not only do mushrooms then play a key role in maintaining the health of forest ecosystems, but they also have enzymes powerful enough to break down toxic pollution and industrialised waste products, um, things like petroleum products, um, and they can turn these into non-toxic compounds. They can soak up heavy metals like cadmium, mercury, lead, arsenic. They can even um, turn radioactive cesium from polluted soil into non-toxic compounds. And in this way, then humans um, uh, are starting to wonder whether we can harness the power of our fungal allies in healing damaged environments. So <clears throat> one study found that different kinds of white rot fungi are capable of um, learning or maybe remembering. Um, Merlin Sheldrake makes a big point about uh, how it's a process of remembering archaic genomic sequences that the mycelium developed hundreds of thousands of years ago but hasn't perhaps needed to use until now. So the idea of temporality in learning and remembering is quite interesting. Um, but they're capable of consuming the chemical compound dimethyl methyl phosphonate, uh, DMMP, which was um, manufactured in the 1980s by Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. We now know that fungi can degrade pesticides, crude oil, even some plastics. They can break down explosives as strong as TNT. And this process is called mycoremediation. It's being investigated in mycological research and its application is being explored within a kind of nascent industry of remediation. Um, so these are sort of industrial applications where we could think about how white rock fungi might help digest pollutants. They could filter contaminated water in um, one um, private setup, I think in um, Northern Europe, they're reclaiming gold from electronic waste. So we're very much thinking about fungi and the possibilities that they have in damaged environments or in um, ecologically more compromised environments in the future. So back to Jane Lawson then, who thinks about mycoremediation. So the installation here on the, on the right is called Manifesto Number no. 2. It was made for Airspace Gallery in Stoke-on-Trent in June 2014. Um, so as you can see then, it features Friedrich Hayek's seminal text on market libertarianism, The Road to Serfdom. Uh, and it's in the process of being detoxified by um, oyster mushrooms. So she has made the book wet and seeded it with oyster mushrooms and then uh, she's watched them grow. And the image on the left similarly is taken from a time lapse film called The Detoxification of Capitalism and Freedom. And this was commissioned in 2014 for an exhibition called Show Me the Money at the Northern Gallery for Contemporary Art. And again, similarly, this shows this sort of micro remediation process of detoxifying Friedman's text, Capitalism and um, Freedom, uh, similarly using oyster mushrooms. Uh, and what she did was she set it up um, with a still camera and did a time lapse film of 40 days and 40 nights, which also, I guess, has biblical connotations. And it was one of a series of key neoliberal texts detoxified by the mushrooms. Um, the others included Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged, The Road to Serfdom, and Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. <clears throat> so as Jane Lawson um, explains then uh, in her web on her website, she says, oyster mushrooms have a wide range of detoxifying properties. They can clean up E. coli in watercourses. They have antiviral properties and can transform a pile of diesel contaminated soil into a thriving ecosystem, supporting plants, insects, birds and animals in a matter of months. 
their ability to clean up hydrocarbons makes them the ideal candidate to detoxify a financial system based on the cheap energy provided by fossil fuels. So Lawson's in a series of installations playfully remind us of the utopian possibilities of um, mushrooms to detoxify pollution. And this pollution is caused by fossil capitalism or petrocapitalism, as scholars in the energy humanities would call it. And this builds on um, recent research into my mycoremediation and particularly the capabilities of mycelium, the potential industrial applications within green technologies. And so there's a lot of tension there, I guess, between Jane Lawson's anti-capitalist and kind of satirical position, but also the fact that capitalism itself is extremely good at absorbing and re-ingesting its own oppositional um, uh, modes of critique. And, and so green technology is also a part of green capitalism. Um, that's a separate discussion, I guess, maybe we can have in the um, seminar. <clears throat> in The Mushroom at the End of the World, the American anthropologist Anna Lernhap Singh takes a more philosophical approach using mycology to help rethink categories of the human and non-human. So she focuses on the Matsutake mushroom, this um, aromatic wild mushroom highly prized in Japan, but now also grown uh, in, uh, particularly in Oregon on um, the west coast of America. And she suggests that the Matsutake offers one way of addressing what she calls the imaginative challenge of living without the handrails of modernization, progress and stability, which once made us think that we knew collectively where we were going. So her main point is that we live in a period in which um, our capitalist system, the mode of production, is in crisis. That doesn't mean to say it's going to end, it just means that there's an enormous amount of precarity within this system and precarious labour. The um, lived experience of the precariat has become um, one of the dominant experiences of our times. And so within this idea of precarity, we might learn from um, a natural example of, of fungal um, mycorrhizal um, networks which are themselves precarious so she's trying to look to mushrooms as this sort of embodied metaphor for entanglement and that might help us think how do we kind of shift our thinking so that we can survive in in this kind of precarious crisis ridden time of, of contemporary capitalism and this was written obviously before covid and before we had a global pandemic which really just exacerbates many of those inequalities so she talks about how we might foster collaborative survival in um, precarious times. Um, okay, one of the things she mentions coming back to this idea of detoxification is that reportedly Matsutake mushrooms were the first living organisms to emerge on the site of Hiroshima's nuclear catastrophe after the atom bomb was dropped by Allied forces in 1945. And I think this image that she chooses of the, the kind of single Matsutake mushroom popping up amidst this ruined landscape of Hiroshima's radio ecology encourages, encourages us to ask a few kind of important questions. What emerges in damaged landscapes, um, in ecosystems on the verge of collapse, after that promise of industrial progress has has fallen away? We, we no longer seem to believe in something that um, I don't know, say kind of Victorian 19th century ideas of history and teleology and progress leading to um, increased uh, satisfaction, um, better healthcare, better education, better kind of social opportunities. We don't believe in that anymore and austerity politics has shown us that that is not, has not been delivered. Um, and you might also point towards Lauren Ballant's argument in cruel optimism that it's cruel to hope for upward social mobility at a time when it's manifestly no longer possible. So um, what, what can the mushrooms and the fungi perhaps help us to do um, at, in terms of collaborative survival? Um, Singh details one interesting example of um, the industrial and the post-industrial history of Oregon in America's Pacific Northwest. She says this is a good example of this kind of ruination that industrial, uh, industrialized capitalist modernity has led us to. So by the early 20th century, the area which um, you know, had made its money through pine logging and through lumber mills 
they were so prolific that they had established Oregon as the largest producer of timber in the United States. And she says, this is a story we know. It's a story of pioneers, progress, and the transformation of quote unquote empty spaces into industrial resource fields. Um, and then um, if we fast forward to 1989 and the ecological devastation caused by the logging industry, which led to old growth logging um, was actually ordered to cease as part of a conservation strategy to save the spotted owl. So an interesting example in um, where kind of ecological and conservation law has sort of knock on effects for the ecosystem around it. She says, if we end this story in 1989 with decay, we abandon all hope and we turn our attention to other sites of promise and ruin elsewhere. So what she's looking for is, um, I mean, arguably it's a utopian search for hopeful signs themselves within the environmental wreckage. And so she says that after the end of the logging industry and after that conservation law in 1989, what actually happened was that um, people turned to foraging mushrooms, which have become really popular in um, Oregon. Um, and so since the logging dried up, this other trade has taken root to the wild mushroom trade. And here too, there's a connection with destruction and the ruin of industrialized modernity with its devastating um, progress. Obviously, <laughs> progress for a particular subject of history, which tends to be white, male, um, you know, up, up, upper or middle class, uh, at the expense of various other kinds of subjects who are ignored or um, pushed out of that category of subject or human. And that would include women and indigenous cultures, particularly in places like Oregon, and it would include any non-human um, subjects uh, as well. So um, mushroom foragers, what's, there's another really interesting connection here is that the foragers themselves came to Oregon from Europe after the 1986 Chernobyl disaster had contaminated their European stock of wild mushrooms. And so they then moved over out to the Pacific Northwest um, to try and find, um, to try and follow what was referred to as a white gold rush. So Singh's point is that we cannot live or think outside of this idea of economic and ecological ruination and giving up just isn't an option. We have to find collaborative strategies for survival and this requires a radical rethinking of the category of the human and its embeddedness, that entanglement I mentioned earlier, within non-human networks of matter, energy and agency. And Matsutake is a really interesting example to take because it's a mushroom that flourishes in forests that have been disturbed by human activity. Um, and so they, in a sense, it's a mushroom that needs deforestation to exist. Um, the host, the Japanese red pine that it grows on will only germinate in areas that have kind of been trampled because of human activity. And again, this points towards these interspecies entanglements. It's not so simple that you have nature over here and culture over here. These are very delicate ecosystems which depend upon human and plant and other ecological forms of activity and behavior to, in order to survive. So this is a kind of collaborative survival um, technique, if you like, and a signifier um, of uh, hope. Uh, and as I mentioned then, this helps us to rethink the category of the human. As uh, Singh writes, imagining the human since the rise of capitalism entangles us with ideas of progress and the spread of techniques of alienation that turn both humans and other beings into resources. Such techniques have segregated humans and policed identities, obscuring collaborative survival. So Anna Lernhaupt Singh's study of um, what we might call mycological possibility or the promise of mushrooms um, amidst the ruins of capitalism brings us to uh, this central question, how can fungi help us to think beyond the human? And in order to answer that question, we're going to need to come back to those scholarly um, sort of discourses I mentioned at the start, particularly the environmental humanities, um, or sometimes referred to as the environmental post-humanities, uh, to signify that we are beyond the human already. So um, the environmental humanities as a sort of term um, has gained traction among a wide variety of academic researchers to begin the work needed for a conceptual shift that can recognize this entanglement between the social and the environmental. As Tobin de Grau and Elisa Fiore write, um, and I quote, uh, 
The environmental humanities bring questions of meaning, value, ethics, justice, and the politics of knowledge production into environmental domains, thus articulating a notion of humanity that rejects modernist accounts of self-contained, rational, decision-making subjects. Um, in order for this to be possible, it builds on quite a lot of philosophical material that has been developed in the past decades, um, dating back to post-structuralist and anti-foundationalist philosophies, particularly the figure of Gilles Deleuze, who becomes important to almost every thinker working in this field. And so they're building on earlier ecological thinking as well to rethink the human subject as one of many participants within lively ecologies of meaning and value. Um, the emphasis here then is that um, non-human actors, whether they are sort of the big charismatic, charismatic um, megafauna, whether they're mammals, whether they're birds, plant life, insect life, or even if they're something kind of non-organic like rock or, or magma even, they have their own kind of sense of possibility and they have their own agency and possibly even their own desires, whether we might understand what those are or not. And they're drawing on Deleuze, they're in this kind of ceaseful, uh, ceaseless sorry, process of um, becoming, that idea of process that Merlin Sheldrake pointed to in Mycelium. We see that coming back again in the philosophy here. So in short then, by operating in the nexus between modernist oppositions, um, environmental humanists would promote a vision of the world uh, in terms of what Donna Haraway has called natural cultural contact zone. So this means then, as I mentioned a moment ago, the natural world is not just the passive background or container for human activity, it's an active agent involved in its own kind of materialization. This is particularly relevant for us when thinking about narrative and literary form, because if the background is kind of inert, passive, available, right, to be developed um, as a set of resources by kind of capitalist modes of production, that would equate to setting in the narrative just being something where human drama takes place. Um, and, you know, many uh, previous uh, literary fictions have done precisely that. The human drama is, the, is what we're interested in, and it's sort of set here, and maybe there are some resonances. Um, whereas the kind of privileged literary texts that environmental humanists would focus on, perhaps, for example, you know, the gothic or the literary weird or, um, or the horror, even horror fiction from the perspective of non-human um, animals or um, monsters or, or that kind of thing would um, threaten the human subject precisely because they are not in control of their own environment and the environment has its own ideas and they may be completely other to human survival. So um, it's not simply then about bringing human humanities discourses into contact with ecology, um, it's actually asking something a bit more radical than that and that is how do we rethink the category of the human outside of this binary of kind of nature and culture and particularly outside of hierarchical models that have traditionally privileged humans above other animals, plants, um, insect life and also ecological systems. So we are animals too, you know, and we're made of ecological and biological matter. And actually what's perhaps been really important for this kind of uh, critical approach is um, research into the microbiome, um, which uh, I think I've got a slide for you. Yeah. So um, we are ourselves, um, you know, made up almost half of our human cells in our body are not actually our own human cells. They belong to so-called microscopic um, colonists composed of bacteria, viruses, fungi and other organisms. So this is sometimes called the hidden half of ourselves, it's the human microbiome, and it reveals that we are more microbial in fact than we are human, uh, and that essential functioning of our bodies, things like digestion, regulating the immune system, protecting us against disease, cannot take place without these microscopic colonists. And so if we are more than half, if more than half of our cells are microbial, what does that do to our understanding of, you know, the human as a philosophical category, as, as a philosophical subject? 
it means that we have to shift our thinking as post-structuralist and anti-foundationalist philosophy has taught us. We have to realize that we are more than human. We have always been more than human. And to, to I understand the human as a discrete bounded subject has always been a fiction really. And it's no longer tenable now that we know from the science um, what's really going on inside our own bodies. So this idea of more than human has become popular, um, particularly amongst human geographers. It describes a less human centered or anthropocentric approach to the environment. And it draws on um, assemblage thinking, which was first introduced by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, uh, first published in 1980. So Deleuze and Guattari are interested in understanding um, processes rather than finished states. Um, you may know if you've come across their thinking before that they privilege the idea of the rhizome, the mycorrhizal network, um, uh, uh, because it um, decentralizes and delinearizes um, their own thinking. So we need to reorient our philosophical lens here to think about the process of becoming always in flux, continuously shifting, evolving, and never static. So um, a useful um, outcome of thinking with assemblages is that boundaries become called into question, um, boundaries between organisms within an ecosystem, boundaries between disciplines in academic and scientific research, and also boundaries between bodily parts and their components. This unsettles the illusion perpetuated in some research that human bodies have fixed or discrete edges in the world, unconnected to life, matter and action around them. Um, and that point comes from Cecily Maller. So uh, the the many, many theorists working in this field will, will refer to the human microbiome as a good example of uh, this idea of more than human. Uh, and that the human body is itself uh, an assemblage. Um, okay, so I've already talked through that. I think it's time to move on then. This interaction between the human body and its microbiota, as well as um, the, the food that we ingest, which is also part of our own um, bodily functioning, shifts our thinking from a static conception of the physical body into a fluid and dynamic understanding of the vibrant processes and performances in which the body participates and that this includes agents other than ourselves. As Anna Lohenhaupt Singh puts it then, humans have evolved alongside the plant, animal and microbial kingdoms in complex multi-species worlds. Okay and I'm just going to read you this passage that I've got here on the slide. She says, Making worlds is not limited to humans. We know that beavers reshape streams as they make dams, canals, and lodges. In fact, all organisms make ecological living places, altering earth, air, and water. Without the ability to make workable living arrangements, species would die out. In the process, each organism changes everyone's world. Bacteria made our oxygen atmosphere, and plants help to maintain it. Plants live on land because fungi made soil by digesting rocks. As these examples suggest, world making projects can overlap, allowing room for more than one species. Okay, so we've covered quite a lot of critical and cultural material, I guess, in this lecture. I just wanted to conclude then with um, one thought kind of burrowed from the microbial sciences. And this is um, not a, a satirical question, this is a genuine research question, can fungi think? Uh, and I think this question uh, helps us perhaps to deconstruct the boundary between the human and the non-human and try and help us move beyond our anthropocentric frames of reference. As we've already seen then in Merlin Sheldrake's study, which I've mentioned at a few points in the lecture, Entangled Life, um, this book reveals the importance of mycelium, not just in, in terms of understanding how ecosystems are knitted together, the way that mycelium is the superhighway through which plant sugars and surplus carbon and information is communicated between plants in the network. But actually, more than that, it helps us to completely dismantle anthropocentric modes of thinking, modes of thinking which position the human at the centre and the human as the kind of default position. <clears throat> 
um, as um, Sheldrake writes then, he says, despite their nearness, fungi are so mystifying, uh, their possibilities so other. Should this scare us off? Is it possible for humans with our animal brains and bodies and language to learn and to understand such different organisms? There's a fascinating avenue of current research then in the microbial sciences, which is looking at this idea of more than human communication. Um, the kind of communication that takes place in mycorrhizal fungal networks uh, and it asks us whether we think fungi are sentient or whether they're capable of cognition. So as we've already seen mycelial networks can process vast streams of, um, actually maybe we haven't already seen this but <laughs> if, I can't remember which bit of the lecture I had to cut out to make this short enough, um, but mycelial networks are bathed in um, huge amounts of chemical data. Um, we know from studies that they um, can make decisions between various kind of courses of action, um, that they are capable of learning or even remembering um, genetic codes, that mycelium is even capable of problem solving. So mycelial networks, in other words, behave like brains, as neuroscientists are starting to realize. Our received ideas of intelligence and cognition are bound up in human-centric, anthropocentric definitions, which hierarchize the animal kingdom above the plant kingdom and the plant kingdom above the fungal, bacterial and viral worlds, um, or the microbial kingdom, if you like. Because these organisms don't look like us, Sheldrake, Sheldrake writes, or outwardly behave like us, or even have brains, they've traditionally been allocated um, a position somewhere at the bottom of the scale. Too often they're thought of as the inert backdrop to animal life. What you can see here on this slide then is research from 2010 done by um, a group of Japanese researchers, scientists, who um, discovered that when they um, released uh, slime mold into petri dishes that they had modelled on the Greater Tokyo subway system network. The slime moulds were able to find the shortest path between two points in the network and this demonstrates that slime mould has the ability to make decisions. And similar studies have shown that slime moulds can replicate the motorway network in the United States and the network of Roman roads in Central Europe. Like these experiments in the problem-solving capabilities of the brainless organism slime mould, Scientists have recently started to explore the behavioural and organisational properties of fungi. Um, so one uh, professor of microbial ecology based at Cardiff, Lynn Boddy, modelled a map of the UK and for each city of the UK she placed um, a, a scale down version um, size, sorry, of a piece of wood, uh, which is the fungi's favourite food. And she encouraged the mycelium to calculate the most efficient routes between these blocks of wood. So London would be the largest block of wood and smaller towns would be smaller and so on. Uh, and what she found was that they did this incredibly effectively and they replicated the motorway network of the M5, the M4, the M1 and the M6. So in this way then, scientists have used slime moulds and fungi to solve human problems and they're now starting to look into ways that the um, organisms might be used uh, in urban transport design and modelling. They're even using slime moulds and fungi to solve mathematical problems and to programme artificial intelligence. So this research then um, leads us to ask whether network-based life forms, the so-called brainless organisms, things like fungi, plants and slime moulds, are actually capable of cognition. Can we think of their behaviour as intelligent? And given humanity's own inescapably anthropocentric bias, are we even capable of recognising intelligence if they have it? Okay, so that's basically the end of this uh, lecture in terms of the kind of context of um, mycology. Um, if you hop over into part two, the next lecture is going to focus uh, much more closely on our set text for this week, which is Tade Thompson's um, Alien Invasion uh, Rosewater. Uh, and I've chosen this novel because um, it uses an alien fungal network for more than human communication. So hopefully um, that will raise some interesting questions for us. Okay, thank you very much. See you later. <laughs>